Welcome to Custom Home Builder Solutions, a web-based software, also known as CHS, a standalone accounting suite focused on job costing and profit management for professional home builders. Hi there. I am Carol King, the developer of Custom Home Builder Solutions software, also known as CHS. CHS is a job costing and accounting software that is custom designed for home builders to bring you and your team members in your back office and in the field together. This picture of me is to show that I have an independent streak that probably like most builders makes me want to be my own boss and not to be required to wear stuffy accounting suits. So you know I really get not wanting to be told what to do, but one thing that I have learned over my years of working with home builders is that there are some rules for best practices that are very essential for success in your industry. And the thing about it is that if you will follow those best practice rules, you will end up not being a slave to your business and you will end up getting that independent freedom you deserve. I'd like to start off by talking about some goals for seamless performance of the construction process. And I have borrowed some words from the well-known home builder consultant, Joe Stoddard, who works with NHB, teaches classes at NHB, and contracts with various builders to advise them about their seamless performance. And he said some of the goals are accurate and timely job cost accounting, minimal misunderstandings with your trades and suppliers, less field work to code and approve bills from trades and suppliers, deliveries on time, really importantly, happy customers that will recommend you with high praise, and having employees that are happy with their environment so that you have low turnover, and very importantly, meeting your expected gross profit goal. There are two terms you'll hear quite often when you're in custom home builders offices. One is the field, which means people that are out working on the sites, and the other is the back office. I heard one builder tell me that the back office only exists to support the field, which makes sense. If you didn't have people out on site or any jobs, there wouldn't be any need for a back office. And I'm going to focus in on these top three goals and how CHS can help you seamlessly have the back office and the field communicate without the field driving to and from the back office to do things like code and approve bills, etc. So here's the thing, as a veteran bookkeeper or controller in the back office of a custom home builder's office for quite a while and then being in many offices, this is a nightmare scenario in a way for me. One of the biggest time eaters I have seen when I worked in and have been in other back offices is that project managers or the big boss even has to code and approve payables bills that have been turned in by trades and suppliers. A big stack of bills has been sent out into the field or the project manager has to come into the office to do this or oh no the project manager is carrying around the stack of the bills and it's getting, they're getting lost under the floorboard of his truck. <laughs> And then the back office, like people like me, I become very impatient about getting those bills back in order to post them in time to figure out how much money to draw and to get them paid by the day we said we would. According to Joe Stoddard, project managers need to spend their time on the job site and should not be driving back and forth to the office to code and approve invoices, only to have the payable staff or the big boss still calling them and interrupting them for more information. He says that the only responsibilities regarding payments to trades or suppliers that the job managers should have are number one, verify that the work or supplies are properly authorized before work begins. Number two, communicate with the home office that the work or supplies are complete and in place. And number three, approve payment of unpaid job cost bills after they are posted and not before. Now I'm going to show you how CHS can make all of this happen and keep that job manager 
on site without ever having this great big stack of payables bills on their desk or that they have to come into the office, etc. Let's keep them in the field. Okay, here's one of those spots where you're going to feel like you're being told what to do. But I can't tell you how important this key to keeping the project manager on site is. I will be paraphrasing Joe Stoddard, a former home builder and general contractor who founded Mountain Consulting Group, and you can see more information about him at the bottom of this slide if you freeze it. And per Joe, the key to keeping the project manager on site is purchase orders, work orders, and variance purchase orders. And before you say, oh, we don't work purchase orders, they're more trouble than they're worth, I'd like you to give me a chance to show you how easy they can be to use, whether you issue them out there to the trades and vendors, or whether you just use them to increase communications between the back office and the field. But Joe says putting a best practice purchasing system into place can make all the difference to quality of life and profits for a home builder. I will show you how using purchase orders or work orders along with implementing a best practice purchasing system creates far less hassle, not more. So let's get busy showing you that. Before I go to the main menu of CHS, I'd like to pique your interest a little about communications between the field, the back office, with the vendors, and with the home buyers. You'll see that there's green comments over here from buyer, peach from the internal CHS user, and yellow from an outside contact, which is usually a vendor. I selected the job I'll be talking about in my demonstration is called Loveman, but let's say I'm just interested in comments going back and forth regarding the roof. So now I just have filtered count of four, and let's go down here and see what the earliest one was. This is a bid request that we sent to Talent Roofing, saying our bid request is attached. They got an email. They could click on something there and see this particular bid request. And in it, what I'd like you to note is that there's a link to plans for, that would relate to the roofing in there for that request. Now let's see what Talent Roofing did. They said our proposal for the loop roofing labor is attached and it's yellow. It's from Talent Roofing and if I click on the attachment I can see that. And you'll see their whole entire proposal here and I noticed that the color wasn't determined yet. So what I did was I sent a message to the home buyer named Jeff saying, have you decided on the color for your roof? And in green is from Jeff, the home buyer, roof color, Duratum. Just thought I'd pique your interest a little bit. Let's get on to the main menu and I'll show you how your team members work together as quickly as I can. This is the main menu where you select things by expanding menus, etc. in CHS. And as I've been touting, this is a full accounting program. You can see where there's places for chart of accounts, general ledgers and financials like balance sheets, trial balances, journal entries, payables, etc. But we're going to focus right now on the intercommunication and not this stuff. In the very next video, I'm going to talk about the unique needs for home builders in their accounting and how CHS satisfies that. But let's just see how we can keep that site manager on the job. One of the very first things you'll be setting up, this is a job cost program. So you're going to need to set up your various cost centers like you like to have them. I'll open that in just a second. I'm going to open something called job stages categories, which is not your cost centers, but I need to point it out and you should keep these simple. When you set these up, we supply some for you based on a simple one, but you can change these, delete them, add to them, etc. But when you set these up, please think of these as probably about the time you might be taking a draw. If you are a home builder who should be watching this, you will understand what stages and phases are. You'll see why I pointed that out in just a minute. You'll be able to use these to group your estimates and budgets by stage instead of just by those cost centers, to do weekly status reports, to start a new job schedule, etc., etc. So I'm going to click Cost Codes Master. What this is, is a list of all your cost centers. 
that you are interested in having when you do job budgets, when you're posting bills to pay, when you're creating purchase orders, change orders, etc. These will be used across the board in CHS to compare all of those various things and to calculate what your current estimated costs at completion are today as things change, which we'll see a little bit in this video. You can load the NAHB recommended cost codes, click this button, you can see a report of them, and then click a load button and use those and then change them, delete them, tweak them, change the grouping titles, see these various grouping titles going on, how you like, add to it, or you can just start setting up, start adding in some groups and then adding in new cost codes. The reason I'm here is because when you set up these cost codes, you will be, let me get down here to a better place. I like to show plumbing and notice here this stage thing and he has three cost centers, rough, top, out, and final. But if you hover over the stage, you'll see which stage those are in. In other words, they happen at different points in time during the job. This becomes very important to have the stage attached because you can issue things like purchase orders up to a certain stage before a stage starts and request certain purchase orders for a stage or approve work done through a certain stage. These are default pricings. This is not a budget. These are you setting up your cost codes. And behind these cost centers, in order to keep them from being too detailed because you don't want to drive your bookkeeper nuts with just a jillion cost centers, is you can create items that you can select from when you're doing a job budget or estimate. Bring these in. You can elect to bring the items in behind the cost center and then check mark which ones you want to use. So a builder should be working on this and setting up some items to go along behind it. If you wanted to get super detailed, you could do a whole bunch of masonry materials, etc., behind the masonry materials cost center, but you shouldn't make cost codes for each one. And a builder will know how to do that. It shouldn't be the bookkeeper setting up these cost codes. It should be the builder. And one reason is that over here, these default notes, I want to show you something about a purchase order. One of the important things that Joe Stoddard uh, points out when he talks about purchase orders is that on the purchase order you should have a good scope of work for what you're expecting from them. We have one loaded in here for framing labor and this is default notes for when you start a new purchase order for framing labor that would already be on the PO. Now notice here all this scope of work verbiage. You can pause this if you like and take a look at it. I'm not going to get all involved in it. You could also upload an attachment that is a scope of work that would get automatically attached to the purchase order itself. But this is your first point of communication is that you, when you issue a PO, you're of course agreeing to a price, which we'll see in a little bit, but you're also telling them what you expect from them. When these drop into your purchase orders, you can change them to be related. Quite often in the, in the verbiage is as per your attached bid, which I'll show you how that gets attached to the PO also, and maybe some plans notes. So I wanted you to know that you should spend some time maybe setting up some default notes that you don't want to have to keep retyping um, to show up on a purchase order. The other thing to set up is, uh, just for example, plan costs, architect fees. This builder likes to base on living square feet. We're now going to jump over here in a second to show you opening the job and how you give specs to the job and use the same default measures so that when you open a new job budget, CHS will look to see if there, for example, for this, for living square feet, if something has been entered as a spec for the job and drop that in as the quantity on the new budget. And it'll drop in the default unit prices and you can then start changing those as you need or once you get bids, etc. So there's some setup that the builder should do here that begins the process of the communication between the team members. Now let's take a look real quickly at setting up a job, the job setup screen, by going to the jobs list. And we have a job I mentioned named Loveman, so I'm going to click L. So I just see jobs with L. And I'm going to click on the pencil edit icon to open the job setup. When you need to add a new job, you will be clicking add new job and stepping through that. This is not a whole tutorial about setting up jobs. You can pause this if you'd like to look over everything. 
But what I'd like to point out at the, is that this builder set up some specs. These are the top six priority specs. Uh, he can set up as many as he likes by clicking this button right here and adding various measures. Um, but this is the six that he wants to show at the top of the budget. Apparently this job does not have any garage square feet. I just wanted to point that out because when you open a new job budget, CHS is going to look to these to drop in some quantities based on the default measures that you set up for your various cost codes that are being brought in. Okay, now I'd like to show you as quickly as I can how you are communicating between the back office in the field and the big boss, and especially by using purchase orders and what a powerful communication tool they are, and then using our estimated cost at completion worksheet to really watch what's happening with everything. I'm going to open the active jobs dashboard that's a button right at the top so that you can work on a lot of things for one job. I'll select the job loveman that I mentioned. And before I go any further, on the uh, window to set up the job I showed you a minute ago, there was a link for this for uploading plans for the job. It goes to this same place. You can upload plans, title them really well and then it will produce small URL links that you can include in notes on purchase orders or bid requests, etc. I won't go into elaborate detail because you'll see that in action. What I'd like to do now is jump over to the job budget worksheet for Loveman or the estimate. We've seen this in a previous video that we put out there about how you can get that sale by using the budget proposals from CHS. So I won't go over into a lot of elaborate detail we talked about. This was a fixed price contract. CHS will also handle cost plus markup and cost plus builder fee contracts. But this was a fixed one. I talked you through how we were doing a markup to match the price and that we were on allowance items, making it so the markup was zero. So this was the markup on all the rest to equal the price to get a 20% gross profit margin. So since we've gotten the contract, because we did such a great proposal, let's take a look at that proposal for just one second. So here is the proposal that we sent out to the customer. I think we've changed a little since that video. But you can see all these great notes and why the builder might have gotten the um, bid and links to plans that the home buyer can see. And these are notes to the home buyer. And you come down to the end and you see the total of the, all these marked up amounts equals the price that was attached. And that's all that I wanted to say because we already went over this in a previous video. So back on the budget worksheet, now that we've gotten the contract, one thing we might want to do is get rid of all these zero lines that we don't intend to do. We're happy with our budget, so there's a tool over here add or remove lines and remove zero lines. You can get a report of the zero lines in case you want to make sure you didn't forget to budget for something, but I'm going to click this to delete all zero lines. And so they're all deleted so you don't have to look at them anymore. And the other thing is since you got the contract, you might like to lock the budget. And it takes, if you lock it, it takes a person with high level permission to unlock it, but all I have to do is click to lock the budget. And now you'll see budget has been locked. And if we head to the framing labor line, because we're going to do something about issuing a PO after we did our estimate, you can see that if you start clicking on these various things, they are not active, but this add new PO will be active. And, I'll, and we are going to go ahead and issue a PO for maybe a little different amount. I've jumped back to the jobs dashboard for Loveman and I'd like to open something called the Estimated Cost at Completion Worksheet because it is the biggest communication tool between the back office and the field about the job costs and where they're heading. Right now you can see that we have our original budget amount down here which is this amount that you saw in the budget worksheet and that our current estimated cost at completion is the same as the budget because we have not issued any POs that might affect that or change orders or actual costs. We're going to be jumping back over to this so that you can get a good idea of how much value there is on this estimated cost at completion worksheet as we do a few POs and enter a couple of bills here. So I just wanted to point that out that it's now open in a tab up here and I can jump back to the budget, jump back to the jobs dashboard, etc.
So now let's play like we're the purchasing person, whoever that might be, the big boss, the field, or whatever, and that we need to issue some POs for various things, bids that have come in, or just based on our general knowledge, talking to them, or however you'd like to do that. But I want to get two or three POs issued. You can see that right now they are zero, the POs that have been issued. And the first one I'd like to do is for framing labor. We're going to go way out of order. But you can see here, if you look along the PO line, which ones you've had issued, POs to or not. But I did an F for framing labor just to see the things that have Fs on them for starting them. So here's framing labor. And I'm going to do plus PO. Tells me didn't find any other POs and did I want to continue. Since it didn't find any others, it brought in information from the budget, which was the quantity. Frame square feet dropped in when we did the budget because of what I explained earlier, a unit price of 12. But what I'd like to pretend is that for some reason, even though we did not get a bid from this particular vendor because we work with them always and it's usually $12 per framing square feet, this time we did get them to agree to have it be $11.50. And I want to show you that now the total is 29 instead of 31 something that is showing back behind here for the budget. Now here's how we communicate to everybody in the field. This is us saying we are going to use a cost of framing to do the framing. So now there's a way for everybody in the office to know who's supposed to be doing the work and I'll show you some other neat things about that in a minute. But this is how fast I can go ahead and create this purchase order. I selected it, changed the price a little, and the purchase order features have been added in. And remember what I said earlier, you could set up some default scope of work notes that would drop in. They came in here for framing labor, just like I showed you. So these are, get, these are ready to be put on the PO, but I could change them however I like. I might be putting something at the top about as per your attached bid, but this one we don't have a bid. But what I might be doing is adding some plans to those notes, which might be the site plan and maybe the roof framing plan and I'll clean those up just a little by putting a little space between them and the previous notes and what I'm going to do is go ahead and create the PO make a comment go out to the vendor that tells them there is a PO and have the vendor sign it and show you the end results and how this purchase order looks after issuing the PO and storing a hard copy and sending it out to the vendor I have returned to the estimated cost at completion worksheet and first of all, what I'd like you to see is that there's a green comment bubble here. I'm going to click it. And you can see that related to that particular cost code 3150 for framing labor and the job loveman, we have two comments or communications going on right now about that framing labor. The first one is us sending out the purchase order. And if I click this paper clip, you would see it. But the second one is that the vendor received it in an email, used our green reply button that said they could also sign the purchase order when they received it, and they did, and I got a message that CHS automatically triggered when they signed it, telling me that they had signed it, and that if I click right here to see the purchase order, we can now take a look at the whole purchase order. I just didn't want to take up too much time. But notice at the very bottom of this, he has signed it, I signed it when I put it out, and let's take a little bit of a look at this. Now I want to tell you that I could have changed this, but I did it too fast. I should have changed the style to say work order. You can do that right before you print it, but I didn't. But it could be saying work order or any other style that you'd like to have up here if you don't like those words. You can set up different styles that will change the title and will also change some other verbiage that you can set up in your style to be a footer for your PO. This uh, builder likes to get elaborate about what he expects on every PO and puts it in and when it'll be turned in and how use constitutes acceptance, etc. But you can set up all your own verbiage that would be at the end of purchase orders or work orders and various different styles. These notes right here came in. I showed you the scope of work that was going to come in, but I showed you that I added um, some plans to those. And if I export this to my Adobe Acrobat Reader, it has to be in a reader for those plans to become really active. And you can see I have an active hand now. 
Um, I'm on my local machine, so those really aren't uploaded out there on this local machine, but your vendor would be able to click on the, those and see the plans when they got the PO. So that's how a purchase order looks and how you can look at all of that once you're on the ECC. We call it the ECC worksheet. But the other thing is here, we have total POs that are now less than our budget, right? Because we got 1150 instead of 12 and we see total POs here. So I want my estimated cost at completion to be this because we're not going to pay that $12. So if I check mark this to use the lower POs as my ECC, you see that my ECC changed to the PO amount instead of the budget amount and that it's showing minus 1304 over here. And so as of now, as soon as we issued that PO, we know that we are heading under budget by 1304. We don't have any actual posted costs yet, but we already know we're going under. We don't have to have some actual costs posted to see that. I'm going to enter a couple of more POs pretty quickly, and we'll talk about those and then how the field can get on and approve those as work done and the various messages about overages and unders and settling disputes happen when the bookkeeper is entering the bill. I've reopened the budget worksheet to show you how I can create a PO from here and did a keyword search for tub and searched for it so that I could get down to K tops and tub allowance and I'll click on that. What we're going to talk about is how we did get a bid and it's uploaded and attached here. But let's go look at edit vendor bids for just a second for this particular cost code. Now you might have several here and then you decide to use this one for the budget, which I did before we did the proposal. I did have this bid in. And so now I would like to issue a PO just from here so that it would attach this particular bid that we got from them. And I'm going to show you that in a minute. So you can see that there's an attachment all ready to go for this PO and it has 6300 there. And if I look at their bid, we're going to have an issue with this when they send us a bill for more than 6300 so it's really great that the bookkeeper is going to be able to drill down on this and see this. So we already had all the vendor filled in and the amounts, but what I'd like to do is I know there's items back there, and I'd like to use items on the PO instead. So I'm going to check mark these to use the items and update the PO amount to use those items when it's printed. Still have the amount of 6300 and I'd probably put here as per your attached bid and maybe I give them the site plans I have, I'm not a builder I have no idea which plans I'm supposed to be giving them and then I would save it and then I do print store PO tell it to use my stored signature and I want to send the purchase order with that number two attachment that we saw over there that I clicked on which is their bid and I will do all of this and come right back and show you the finished PO so now we're back on the estimated cost of completion and you can see that we did issue a PO. It is kind of fun to do the POs from here. If you're trying to issue a bunch of them, you can see which ones you've done and which ones you have not. If I drill down on the comment again, you can see that they sent it back signed. If I click to open this purchase order, you will see it with its two items and a link to the site plan, which if I sent this to Adobe would be active. And this is a link to their comments attachment that is their bid. So let's just stick a pin in that right now. You can see how many POs there are. And I'm probably going to go issue a couple of more POs and I'll be right back. Okay, I'm back on the estimated cost of completion worksheet after I've entered several more POs. All of them are for the amount of the budget because I was using bids to do the budget and was issuing POs to match those. I'd like to show you a quick way to look at everything that has happened and that is to look at the file cabinet of uploads for this job and cost code. Notice that we have the Ferguson Appliances bid that they sent us. So we could look at that for appliances is the one that I clicked on. We could look at their bid if we want to right away to see all of the things that are on their bid. Also, we see that we have sent and uploaded a hard copy of the purchase order that you just saw. You can take a look at the purchase order right here, the hard copy of the purchase order. On the cabinets right here, if we look at the uploads, I'd like to show you a purchase order. This is a PO. We sent a PO hard copy. And here is the PO hard copy. 
with a list of a bunch of items that we probably got on their bid, but because I'm not really the builder, I don't have all copies of the bids. I'm using some information from another builder that was kind enough, but you can see how that PO had a list of all the items. I'm going to get on and go ahead and issue a variance PO for something that happened. Notice that up here we have a slab contract PO and we had plumbing going on. So let's play like the slab people after the rough plumbing was done down here. Um, actually damaged a pipe in the rough plumbing. And we've talked to United Plumbing who's, who's done the work. You can see all of that if you look at their PO, etc. And I, But they have said that they damaged a pipe and we're going to charge $250 for that pipe. So I'm going to do a plus PO here and it found that I already have some. So it's just coming in waiting. PO title to replace damaged pipe and I'm going to call it a variance PO. And let's just say they're going to charge us, I don't know, $250 for that damaged pipe. So let's, and we put it into the rough plumbing because that's where all of that would have happened. Wanted to show you over here a variance. You can give it a reason why and you can set up various uh, variance reasons just to know. And I type some internal notes. We are back charging big buck for the damaged pipe. So I'm going to select Big Buck Construction and I'm going to enter an amount and we'll charge them the whole amount. It says enter a positive number. And then I'm going to save this PO. Close that. So you'll see right here where rough plumbing is. We're seeing a variance PO and that we're headed over by 250. But let's see what happens if we take a look at the notes behind that to investigate. Notice that we can see the two POs to United Plumbing. We are back charging Big Buck for the damaged pipe. So maybe we won't worry about it too much. Because what I'd like to show you real quickly to go with that is if we go home, post new payables charges from scratch, and we've got that bill from United Plumbing. We'll come back and do some others in a minute, but I just wanted to make a point while I'm talking about this. Selecting United Plumbing says there are open POs, but I'll create a job related. We could create it from the PO, but I want to do it right here. Now I'm going to look at the drop down of POs. This is where we're entering a bill, and this is not supposed to be a whole tutorial about entering a bill. But I'd like to go on down, and I could have started typing Loveman. I have a bill, I say, for 250 But look how it says right here, it dropped in. Is there a back charge? Yes which you can physically do, select guess here, and then this area would open up for back charge to big buck. What's going to happen when I post this invoice is that a negative credit will be put under big buck to take away from any other bill that, that we might enter for them. So just please remember that. Let me just put an invoice number of 010521, which oftentimes because you need an invoice number, you use six digits for the date. I'm going to submit this as an unpaid bill. I did that real fast. We're not going over all the fields here, but I just want to show you what happens. And we'll see that in a minute, so just stick a pin in that. While we are still here, let's go ahead and do the bill for the rough plumbing, the basic bill. And we're going to select that PO for Loveman. Let's just start typing. And that's for the rough plumbing. Maybe for the invoice number, we'll do 809. And I'm going to submit this. That's how fast, because you have a PO, you can prepare a bill uh, without typing in all of the rest of the information. I'm going to post it as unpaid. And now let's jump back to the ECC. Let's refresh it. And let's take a look at that rough plumbing. All of a sudden we show that we have $3,600 in bills, but we're thinking, what about this $250? But look, let's take a look and drill down on those bills. 3600 We can see two to United Plumbing, one for 250 one for 3600 And that we back charged Big Buck, which we'll be taking away from Big Buck, the vendor Big Buck. So I'm going to go ahead. First of all, this would have caused the alert that you see the over 250 But I'm going to mark these actual costs as done. In other words, we don't intend to have any more costs in 
and we've cleared that out to zero because actually we are only going to pay 3600 because we're charging big buck for that so let's go to big let's go to the slab contract right here see that we have issued a purchase order let's jump back to create bills big buck create a job related bill for big buck for the slab what I'm pointing out here is how handy it is to have everything in one program. Also notice that we're getting a notice that workers comp is, is expired for big buck. Also if their general liability had been expired we would see that. We can elect to deduct some from them but we won't. But you could also send a request to vendor for the workers comp right there. But let's select a PO for Loveman. Let's give them an invoice number that goes with the PO. Maybe you have an invoice from them, but let's submit. Now let's jump back to the ECC. Let's refresh it for the slab contract. We see it's 34400, 34400, and we know we're not going to pay them anymore, so we might as well mark that as done, those actual costs. However, when we go home and we go to unpaid bills, unpaid bills, and we just look for one for big buck. I want you to notice that this is the screen where the bookkeeper would select bills to pay and that there's a minus $250 here for Loveman to take away from what we were paying big buck. So when we cut this check, it will be for $34,150. And this is all caused, all this communication, because we had that variance PO, because we had another PO for big buck, you can see how quickly I was entering the bills. Now I know that this video is getting long, but if you are interested in purchasing CHS, I think it would behoove you to see everything that it's doing that QuickBooks can't do for you. So I've opened the jobs dashboard for our job loveman and I'm going to go to a purchase orders list or management, POs and cost management. You can narrow down your POs list to a set of vendors, a set of cost codes, and you can say I only want to see everything through a certain stage. So you might go up here and say I only want everything through foundation. I just want to look at POs through that because I am being the project manager and I am coming in here to let the back office know what work is done on various POs. Now if you'll notice here, we're seeing the PO total and we're seeing posted costs. And you have seen me enter the posted costs for this, so the amount done, PO is done. There's no amount left here, no PO remaining amount. But right here, there's a PO remaining amount for framing labor for 29992 and I could just create a bill from that, which we'll see in just a minute. But here's the project manager saying, okay, the framing labor is done, but I want to charge them a little for site cleanup. So I'm going to charge them maybe $200. And I'm going to type, and I'm going to save this. And this is the field talking to the back office right here. First of all, that the work is done. So the bookkeeper might decide to create a bill from this when they come in because they can check mark yes to only see ones that work is done and they can also just see open POs. So if I check marked that, this wouldn't show anymore, but I'm not going to do all of that right now. So let's do the create bill from here. Looks like their general liability and workers comp is expired because I have old stuff in here, but we're just going to ignore that. I could have sent a request right then for their general liability certificate again. But look how everything has filled in here for 29792. If I do the drop down to take a look at it, it's 29992. And what I'm going to do is wonder about that. And I might click on PO status and approval notes. And I might see charge 200 for site cleanup. But I'm a very diligent bookkeeper. So I want to see those separately so it's clear to the vendor. So I'm going to reselect that PO so that it's 992. And it's telling me someone's posted an amount to deduct from this PO so that I might want to look at those notes. But let's go ahead and copy this line so we have a second line. And we're going to do, we know we're going to do minus 200. And we're going to do charge for site cleanup. 
right here, but both of them are attached to that PO. So I'm going to go ahead and submit that. You can see how I was alerted it one way and then another way when I did it from Create Bill, but if I had selected, if I had just opened this and not done it from the Create Bill and selected that PO, I would have gotten that pop-up notice to take a look at the notes from the field. So let's submit that. Post it as unpaid. And now we are back on here and you see the minus 200 here. Create bill, but we don't want to do that and we know that. So we're going to mark this one as done. So there's no amount here for creating bill. And we'll mark the work done too. So we know it's all done. So that's happened. So we're only going to be paying this much for that. Now I'd like to do another one that has to do with a dispute with SunWest Tile based on their bid, etc. So down here, somewhere, we have SunWest Tile. So the field has marked that the work is done, and let's go ahead and create that bill. So everything dropped in to pay them 6300 but let's pretend that I have a bill sitting here that I'm looking at that they handed me, and I'm going to upload it. So you can see that I did upload a bill, and there's a paperclip attachment. I didn't take the time to show you all of that, but I'd like you to see something on this bill. It is not for 6300 because there's a line for add extra tile to ceiling and both shower walls, which might cause me as the bookkeeper to see if I can see their original bid. So I'll close that, and let's take a look at the POs, which we see that same sort of screen, but I want to drill down to the PO and see if there's a bid attached. And sure enough, there is with a paperclip icon on the PO, and I'm going to open that. And I'm going to take a look at it and study on it. And I'm a smart enough bookkeeper. Sometimes I might not be. I might be writing a note out to George, the project manager, to say this is for more. But it says add one recessed soap niche to both bath walls, so it's included in the bid. So you can see how quickly you can see that. Now we're back on this screen. So what I want to do to help make it clear to the project manager when they're approving bills to pay I'm going to put this 550. I'm going to go ahead and enter it. And I'd like to make a point about entering everything from the bills so that the field can see all of it. So I'm going to do SunWest overcharged C bid. And I'm, that's just a note so they can see it. And I'm going to go ahead and include it with this PO. I think I'll just set it to none and not even attach it to that PO. So let's set it to none. First of all, I will give them a comment. So let's go ahead and submit that. Notice that we're getting warnings about being over POs and budgets. And if I pause, I can look at over budget. And I can see it's trying to tell me that you're going over budget by 550 and it's giving me a report of what's about to be posted, what the original ECC was. And it's telling me I'm going over the POs. And I can go back and compare the cost to the POs if I like. So let's submit it again. We've already studied on the overages. Continue submit. Post it as unpaid. So now you can see the amount that has been posted here and that there's a $550. It's ready to make a variance PO if we like, but we're not going to just because we kind of know it won't be paid probably. But somebody could make a variance PO to explain why that is over. What I'd like you to see is also how the field can look at bills, not overhead bills or anything else, but all the unpaid posted job costs for this job so far. And I'd like you to notice that down here on SunWest Tile, you see the 6300, yes, a PO. 550, there's no yes here for the PO. And if I look at the comments, I can read what Carol King was sending to me. Now I'm playing like I'm George Brown looking at this list, but I'm not really. So when I do a reply, it would be saying from George Brown, not from me. And it would be going to me. But let's just not take up time to go do all that. Do not pay this. So now you can see, and that would say from George Brown. So I might, as the project manager, go ahead and put an OK to pay this part of it, but not this part of it. Then I would go through, be able to drill down on ECC, see overages. For example, if I drill down on the ECC for this one right now on SunWest Tile, I would see this part also about how it's headed over by 550. 
Now what can happen for the bookkeeper when they are selecting bills? Back over on the home menu. Unpaid payables, unpaid payables. We're looking at all the bills and we're scrolling down and we're trying to decide on ones that we're going to mark to pay. But notice how we see OK 1 and beside, you can select all to pay that have been marked that OK 2 is OK. The big boss can see all these with the overhead bills. Drill down on ECC and everything else and put an OK 1 here if that's your procedure. These are not required but they're certainly handy to be able to see that this has been approved but this has not been approved and that there's a comment and if I open it I'll see George telling me not to pay this. So what I might decide to do is delete this right now or I might go enter another bill for minus 550 just so we have a trail of all this saying not paying that we send to United Plumbing. So I would have three lines a plus 550, minus 550, and 6300, and only pay 6300 when that check is cut, and I check mark it to pay in a check run. I wanted to show you how handy it is to be able to upload all those things while you're entering bills, how much you can see, and how much you can warn the field about what is going on before any of this gets paid. So to make my final point, Back on the vendor bills approval that a project manager can open and sit and start okaying things to pay, they can see all kinds of things. So this is instead of that big stack of bills all over their desk. And this is the reason that the bookkeeper should just go ahead and post the bills as they come in so that you can review the ECC to see what might be going over and so that the project manager is able to come in here and actually see the bills. For example, on that SunWest tile, remember we uploaded a copy of their invoice, and there it is that had that overage on it. And they can drill down on the POs and the POs and costs and the ECC and see everything about what is going on. They don't have to run to file cabinets, look up, see what we've already paid, that kind of thing. If they do the ECC, they can see what actual bills have been posted and that they're unpaid and what the original ECC was and that we're headed over bid by this 550. Again, just to reiterate my point, this is the stack of bills that would have normally been on their desk but is now on this screen where you can write notes back to the bookkeeper where the bookkeeper can send you comments that you see in green so that you go, okay, I need to look at this and so on. Back on the jobs dashboard, Look at this vendors to use list. What this is, is based on POs that have been issued. And just based on the POs that I've issued, there'll probably be a lot more of them. This is a list by cost code of everybody who has been selected to do the work because we issued them a PO with all of their contact information. That'd be handy to print out and have on your desk or running around in a notebook that you have or that you're on CHS and can just get a big list of who all is supposed to do the work and what their contact information is. And there's just one more area that I'd like to show you and that has to do with how handy purchase orders are for scheduling. I have opened the job schedules menu and selected Loveman and just did a quick start of a schedule that hasn't really had anything done to it. But let's take a quick look at the Gantt view of it for just a second. I am going to demonstrate how handy POs are for getting tasks into this. Let's expand this. Now notice all CHS did when, when I selected to start a new schedule is that it put in projects that are here in blue that are the various stages that I mentioned at the first of this video that you can set up. Now there's a temp task in each one of these that you could double click on. You could type in some name for the task, give it a task title, assign it to somebody and set the date if you like here. I'll cancel that. These tasks are where you can start expanding them and the project moves over etc. But nothing has been done to this schedule yet other than starting one day for each project and putting a task because every project has to have a task attached otherwise it won't show up here. But what I'd like to show you about purchase orders is this. Notice that down here, 
CHS has detected that there are unscheduled purchase orders found. That's all these purchase orders that we created earlier. So if I click to add purchase order tasks to schedule, there's a purchase order for plan costs and I click schedule it. And I add that task to the schedule. Click schedule it. There's that big buck slab contract PO that we talked about. Now I'm going to pause a minute and go ahead and schedule the rest of these and be right back. So I have scheduled everything and I'll show you what that means by reopening the Gantt view. Notice that there's no longer in red over there that there's POs that haven't been scheduled. Now let's expand this all. Now notice how this temporary task just got changed to plan cost architect fees in stage zero pre-construction. And let's just say we think that's going to take three days. So stage one moved on over. Foundation, that big buck, slab contract. We can see that. Let's say it's, we think we're going to give it three days. And this is, you can hover over it to replace the damaged pipe. And this is the rough plumbing. So we're going to actually move the rough plumbing to here and say it's going to take a couple of days. I, I'm not a builder. I have no idea how long these things take. And then we're going to move this and you're going to notice we're going to put it way over here. Now you'll notice the order of everything under this stage got changed because this is where we're replacing that pipe that we talked about. If I move it here, it's going to cause the next stage, but to replace pipe. But notice how I can see that the assignee on these is United Plumbing, that this is Big Buck. I can double click and edit some various things about this and some notes, add some notes about the task if I like. But see how you can start doing all of this by the fact that you had POs that will put them in the right stage based on the cost code that the PO had and the stage that was assigned to the PO and real quickly get in who's supposed to do the task without wondering. So that's another communication tool that the POs create is that they help you make a job schedule. So I'm going to sum up with what purchase orders, work orders, and VPOs can do for you and how they can keep that project manager out on the site. Very importantly, a purchase order is a legal agreement that you can use in disputes later to show how they signed it and agreed to something. You can communicate the scope of work or material that the vendor will provide. Communicate to the field who is doing the work and what they will be doing. Everybody on the team knows who is doing the work for each cost center, so no coding is needed on bills from vendors. Keep that project manager on site. Field can use list of POs to let the office know if the work is done and if there has been any issues. The bookkeeper can simply create a payables bill from PO if you decide that you would like to go paperless. When approving posted bills to pay, the field can drill down to the PO and see the original bid right on the screen. And you can get a great list of vendors that you have issued POs to with their contact information. And it makes it easy, like I showed you, to add a task to the schedule based on the PO. So a PO makes it so that everyone on the team is sure of what is planned and what is happening. You don't have to use POs in CHS. But with CHS, you have a system that handles all of this, so why not use it? Thank you for watching.